I tried vegan. For a lot of people, including myself, I just didn't think it was doable. I was like, what do I make for dinner? One of the big things that I read about you that I thought was fascinating was this whole McDonald's thing. We looked at McDonald's to see if we could influence them to have a plant-based burger. Today, I had Kathy Freston on the podcast. She's an amazing guest. She's a New York Times bestseller and has written nine books. She's an outspoken advocate for human rights, animal rights, and climate crisis. She believes that going vegan is one of the ways to save the planet. She has written many books about this topic. Her most recent one is 72 Ways to Become a Vegan. And she talks about why it leads to better sex. All right, I'm interested. We'll talk about it. But our episode today talks about her journey and more so than just her journey about like an agent of change, what it takes, all the things you go through, allowing yourself some room to not be perfect, and just being aware of the decisions that you make, what you're eating, what you're doing, and what that impact truly is. So I'm excited for you to listen to this episode and let us know what you think. All right, so I guess the way I want to start today is in your 30s, I think I read correctly, that's when you started to go vegan, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least vegetarian. So what happened in your life that caused that shift? Well, I certainly would not have predicted this. Uh, I was a girl growing up in uh, rural Georgia, and I ate everything in sight that was from an animal, you know, ribs and burgers and sausage and milkshakes and everything. And I never thought anything about it. But then I was writing books on waking up and having awareness. I, I was also a meditation teacher and I was really talking about mindfulness. And I realized that I don't have much mindfulness around my food. I don't have much uh, awareness around my food. Somebody, some organization had sent me a brochure and it depicted um, a cow being dragged to slaughter. It was a dairy cow that was being dragged by a forklift because she couldn't walk anymore. It just stung me in such a way that was, it just like smashed my, my mind open. And it was a couple of days later that I was playing with my dog, Lotsey, from Everest and Lotsey. <laughs> yes, I, um, we got to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I named my dog Lotsey. The other one was called Everest. Um, so uh, I was playing with her and she was on her back and her little feet were sort of joyously playing with me. And I, I just felt this love in my heart for her. And I thought... I just love animals so much. And this voice in my head said, well, if you love animals so much, why are you eating them? And it was like that very inconvenient sort of nudge from the universe, you know, how the universe sort of nudges you to keep growing. And it was like, damn it. I don't want to think like this, you know? And so I just was looking at her and I thought, okay, I'm just going to do a little thought experiment. I'm going to picture her in line going to slaughter like pigs do, like cows do, like chickens do. And I thought I would do anything to save this animal from that horrible fate because my dog Lotsey could, she could smell everything. She, you know, if there was someone that was anxious in the room, she would feel it. She was so sensitive, right? And she was, I I knew her fears. I knew her anxieties. I knew what made her frustrated. So to picture her in that line, I thought I would do anything not to have her suffer like that. And so then I thought to myself, well, if I would go to any length to protect Lotsey from that kind of suffering, why am I complicit with the suffering of cows, chickens, pigs? as they go to slaughter, you know, because I'm complicit because I eat them. So I'm part of the market that supports that practice. So in that moment, I thought I would really love to be someone who does not eat animals or, or their stuff like eggs or dairy, but it was just such an overwhelming prospect for me because that's all I ate (laughs) from morning till night. Right. I just thought, okay, well, like with anything, I've ever done. I'm just going to set my intention. I am going to push myself forward and I'm going to find my way and I'm not going to guilt myself 
And I'm just going to, I'm just going to allow it. I'm just going to allow this process to unfold. I was watching one of your videos and you were saying the 85% rule, which I loved. Instead of pushing yourself 100% or 110%, which is tempting to say, like, I'm going to be perfect at this. For me, I knew I would fail if I tried to be perfectly, you know, not eating anything from an animal. So I just leaned into it. And over the course of about a year, year and a half, I became fully vegan. So then I started writing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think it's fantastic. I tried vegan before and um, I was good at it. And then I guess that things you just get off track. I don't know. I got up, like I like eggs snuck in again yeah. somehow. Yeah. And yeah. And then like I'm excited to talk to you today because I love your concept of leaning in mm-hmm. and allowing that space to be okay, this is a gradual shift. This Mm -hmm. isn't like cold turkey overnight, never going to fail. And when you get off the bandwagon, that doesn't mean you have to be off of it. You can get back on. No, because we all, I mean, we all fall off the bandwagon. You know, I'm sure your first trek was not a successful one. You know, you you didn't go straight to the peak on your very first try, or maybe you did in some places. But I mean, for, for most of us, it takes a lot of preparation and and habituating ourselves to this new way of being and building our muscles and really um, seeing that it's doable. You know, for Mm -hmm. a lot of people, including myself, I just didn't think it was doable. I was like, what do I make for dinner? I mean, if I'm not having chicken and potatoes (laughs) and a salad, what am I having? You know, I don't even know what that looks like to grocery shop. So it's, it's a gradual process. And I think it's one that has legs. It has, it, it lasts when you allow yourself to, to lean into something. Oh, right. And then like when we see these videos, cause I've seen them, right. And mm-hmm. then after those videos, you're just mortified mm-hmm. and shifts are a lot easier because mm-hmm. you had this triggering experience. Mm-hmm. Um, what about like the farms We have the local farmer, you buy like the local caught fish or the different Mm -hmm. things like that. Are they still being processed that way? Are you just saying, hey, I'm staying away from those because it's the whole theory behind the animal concept? Well, there it's it's federally mandated slaughterhouses. So if you have an animal that grows up on a, you know, farm where they're eating grass and and wandering, which is probably 1% of the available um, animals to eat, um, they still go to the same slaughterhouses. So they still meet that horrible end, you know, with the same practices, the same smells, the same inhumane treatment. And I won't go into it because I don't like to trigger people. And certainly if you have a curiosity, you can just Google factory farm slaughterhouse and you'll get tons of information. You know, there's, there's more to it than just that. I know Michael Pollan Mm -hmm. says, you know, well, the animal had a great life and then there's one bad day, but I think that's a little, um, it gives the impression that one is only going to eat like that. And for me, I go out to restaurants and I know there's no way that that's the food being served because it's so much more expensive. I mean, my mother would never spend the money to get grass fed, grass finished beef. It's just way out of the realm of possibility for most people. A, it's not very available, you know, in in stores unless you're in a big city and, you know, you've got lots of money. Um, But it's just not it's just not feasible in terms of being affordable and available. And then also it it doesn't it doesn't speak to the climate change issue or the ravaging of our land and water because animals who are raised on pasture, say cows raised on pasture, they actually do worse for the environment in terms of climate change. So you're not actually doing better for it. And there's not available land to raise animals like that. So say you wanted to only have in the world grass-fed beef, for instance, we'd have to take down every single parking lot, every single building. There's just not the available land to support that kind of uh, animal agriculture. So kind of across the board, plus I just don't want to kill someone who doesn't want to die. So if, if an animal is created... Uh, you know, and uh, she she wants to be with her young, her her family. Who am I to go in there and interrupt that 
if I don't have to, right? And so humans right. are omnivores. We can survive on meat. We can survive on plants. We can basically survive on anything. I happen to, the research that I've um, trusted is we're optimally eating plants, but I also just don't want to do that if I don't have to. And there's so much available plant-based food now. So for me, there's no reason to eat meat, whether it's humanely raised or not, you know? Yeah. And that's another thing. The, the humanely raised labels are, they're kind of not true. Like you could say, oh, these are eggs from humanely raised chickens, but, or free range chickens. That can be a huge, huge shed. And there's a little little door on the other side of the shed that a chicken who is raised to be so fat can never get over to the other side. So it's, you know, yes, the potential is there, but it's in, in practice, it really doesn't work. So, um, I don't really trust those labels when they say humanely raised. Um, it's just easier for me to eat plant-based. Yeah, no, I understand that. So I raised chickens with my kids once. We yeah. lived in Michigan before we lived, moved to Park City. And oh. we bought little chickens that we had to have them killed by a certain age because oh. genetically they got so big that their legs mm-hmm. couldn't support their weight no matter what. Yeah, isn't that crazy? And it was like, what? Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, it was, it was crazy. And so well, then we did take it to like a local farm and did all the things you're supposed to do. And we did eat the meat and it was, it's one of those things where I actually remember the taste of the meat and thinking, what do they sell at the store? Cause that's not like, this is like, tastes like entirely different things. Like how is this the same bird per se? Like it was, it was just a a fascinating experiment all the way around that I look back on it and it's just like, we're never doing that again. Like that was horrible. I was like, yeah. what do you mean these things are genetically modified that yeah. they cannot support their own weight at a certain age? Like it's- and There's something called an obesogenic gene. So they are, they are like you said, uh, raised and, and uh, genetically altered to become huge because it puts on more weight. So they're more valuable at slaughter because you're getting more meat and they can't support their legs. But we're eating that stuff. You know, when we're eating chicken, we're eating those those genes, those chemicals, the the meat, all of that stuff is embedded in that animal that we consume. So it's um it's pretty gross when you think about it. Yeah. You know, no, it's, I know. it's pretty gross. And then, you know, even even then you, you get to know the animals. Um, a friend of mine in Arkansas, they're uh, ex chicken farmers and I went into the sheds before they, um, you know, gave up chicken farming and just the, the smell, uh, of these, these sheds, is just incredible. It's like, you need goggles. You, I wore a respirator because you can't breathe. It'll burn your lungs. The ammonia, you know, it's just really awful. So uh, when you think about it, it's like, do I want to consume that kind of food? Do I want to put that kind of energy, um, that kind of misery into my body? I, I, I don't want to. And if I have a choice, I, I, I'm not going to. So it's been a gradual evolution of kind of a waking up for me. Yeah, no, I think it's, I, there's definitely things to explore and you bringing voice to it and just light to some of the issues that people can gloss over. It's just different. Like I went climbing in Pakistan um, to climb K2 and we hiked in with the chickens and the goats and the donkeys carried her stuff and they brought in a big ox and they hiked it, I mean, all the way to base camp. And then at base camp, they would kill these animals and then that's what they would serve for dinner. And I... Like, I, I couldn't eat it because I'm like, no, I just fed that chicken the entire time we came here. Like, I felt bad for the chicken. Like, I made sure all the animals were okay. Now, of course, I ended up getting sick from one of the animals because farm animals can carry anthrax in different countries. So I ended up getting anthrax, which is just insanity. But when you connected so much to your food source that we are so removed from, it changes your perspective on all of it. There's a reason that slaughterhouses don't have glass walls, because if we saw what was happening, we would definitely not 
support that industry. We would be so horrified. So the industry keeps us out. And that's why they have these ag gag laws where they don't want people sneaking in and taking video footage because they don't want consumers to see where their um, meat, dairy and eggs come from. Yeah. But that's so sad. I mean, those animals, my God, to hike up in that, in those conditions, is such an unnatural terrain for them and to make it all that way and all that weather. And then it just seems, it seems like, I don't know. I, I, I'm not saying it about that particular situation. I'm just saying about in general, it just feels like it's an abomination of, of nature. Like these, these, Animals are so lovely and want to create no harm or malice or anything. And then humans, we just uh, we just take them for for granted and 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 use them. It, it kind of makes my heart sad. Yeah, no, it it was too close for comfort for me. It was yeah, it was one of those things where I'm like, oh, I'm glad. Yeah, not okay. Um, so you started, which I kind of, I wanted to hit on this a little bit more. You started in meditation and a meditation teacher and you wrote meditations and all this kind of stuff. How do you feel that foundation has helped you in your other pursuits? Well, the meditation, so I wrote about it. Well, I, and I produced CDs, um, guided meditations back before mindfulness was, was not as talked about, um, it, to me, it was just all about setting your mind to something, being open and aware and just really looking clearly at something and to be clear about what you want in your life. So I'm just kind of a self-help person at heart because I just think we have this power within us to move ourselves forward. And I think it's kind of like an evolutionary impulse to move forward, you know, to get deeper, to expand our minds, to be kinder, more conscious. So I think doing that kind of work with the meditations set me to thinking about how to articulate change, how to articulate when you want change, what do you do? What does it take? Because my meditations weren't just about mindfulness. They were sort of about achieving something, whether it was creating abundance or getting pregnant, or healing from a disease, finding love, they were all very intentional. So I think that just writing the script for them got my mind into the space of what do we actually need to do with our brain to affect change in our lives. And it got me into sort of that self-help writing mode, which then later translated into writing books. Yeah, no, I mean, and you've written nine of them so far, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah, she's saying this is the last one. I'm never going to write again. <laughs> and, then, and then an idea starts going and I'm like, oh, I think I have to write another one, you know? No, I just feel with that meditative self-awareness, you're using it for change. Mm -hmm. It just helps you in all your pursuits, right? Writing the book, Mm -hmm. saying, okay. Because one of the big things that I read about you that I thought was fascinating was this whole McDonald's thing. Oh, So like, tell us the story of McDonald's because there's a lot of good there. Well, so McDonald's is like, they're they're one of the biggest... uh, places that meat is sold. And I thought if we want to reduce animal suffering, then the best place is to take meat off of our plate sometimes. And one of the best places to do that is McDonald's because they sell so much meat and, uh, and people don't even think about it. It's just like a burger, a burger, burger. So it made sense that we looked at McDonald's to see if we could, you know, influence them to have uh, a plant-based burger. So I just started a petition on change.org and it got a lot of signatures and they called me to Chicago and, you know, sort of sat down with the the head chef at the time. And we sort of went back and forth on what it could look like and their reasons not to, their reason not to for a long time was that they would have to retool uh, their machinery because plant-based burgers are cooked differently than, than meat burgers, animal burgers. So, um, so yeah, so they, then they didn't really 
make any changes. And so then we took the campaign to their headquarters in Chicago, downtown Chicago, and we delivered like all these signed petitions <laughs> to their office. And it was all over the news and in the papers and everything. So it was, they got a lot of pressure. And so they're, they are testing burgers now. I think they're testing Beyond Meat. And hopefully they'll be rolling out a, uh, a plant-based burger in all the stores soon. It's so overdue. You know, it's just like the culture is changing. There's something called the veto vote. And the veto vote is that if, say, three or four of us want to go get a bite to eat and three people want meat, but one person wants something plant-based, we're going to go to the place that has an option for everybody, right? We're not going to go to McDonald's if there's no option for a, a vegan, uh, you know, menu idea. Not because there's so many vegans, but just because there are people whose doctor said you need to lower your cholesterol, so you need to stop eating so much meat. Or there are people who want to lose weight because, you know, they know that they've been consuming too much, you know, fat in the meat that they're eating. So it's not just that vegans want an option, but there are lots of reasons why people will say, I think I want to get a plant-based burger today or plant-based item. And um, so people are not going to go to McDonald's if there's not an option. Whereas Burger King has an impossible Whopper, you know, they they have the option for everybody. So hopefully McDonald's is getting on board soon because they're kind of late to the late to the party. Right. But I, I think the cool thing about this is you started that in maybe 2014. Mm. Was that when it started? Ish, maybe. Yeah, and like, look where we fast forward to today, right? Change takes a long time, but it just takes like persistence and a, a chance for it to grow. And grateful that Burger King jumped on. And but it's like all these little things—they don't happen overnight, but you still have to have the energy behind them to make them happen. Well, the, we have to, yeah, as activists and advocates, we have to make some noise. We have to, you know, continue to be out there uh, on one level, exposing what's happening behind closed doors, you know, to the animals. On another level, we have to rattle the windows of these corporations who just want to make profit and don't really see the future coming in. And we just have to, you know, kind of hit it from all sides. Like, and the, and the culture is changing. The younger people do not want to eat all this meat. They see what's happening with the climate change stuff and, and the, the waters being polluted and the land being uh, used for, for all this uh, agriculture that doesn't serve anybody. So things are changing and corporations are sort of slow to catch up sometimes. Mm -hmm. And do you, how do you, I mean, I know it's such a lifestyle for you now and such like your purpose how do you keep the momentum going and like you energized about it when things don't go as fast as you want or don't come together as quickly? Uh, all I have to do is w watch a video and see yeah. what happens to the animals. And I, as much as I'd like to curl up and say, I'm just going to watch Netflix and forget about the whole thing. There is an animal suffering and an animal suffering and animal suffering. So I just, uh, it's in me to feel personally responsible because I'm a human on this earth. If I have a voice, I should be using it. I believe that there's a lot of burnout in, in this uh, movement that I'm part of, sort of moving away from eating animals uh, because people see really painful things over and over and over again. And, and it's uh, extremely wearing. It's, you know, the, the soul <laughs> suffers sometimes. So I, I believe there's got to be balance. You know, you got to just kind of let yourself go and forget about things sometimes and enjoy the weekend and go biking or go out to a fabulous dinner or whatever. But come Monday morning, you know, get up and figure out how to address it again. Because if you don't, that's one less voice in this movement that's, that's advocating for an animal. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that lesson in to all things that we do, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that, hey, I need to relook at this to keep it pressing and urgent and understand, like, you need to recommit. And yeah. making it visual can help you recommit, but then also not having it so consuming that it's so heavy that all of a sudden you're not enjoying life. And yeah. so you do the weekends to bike and do these other things. So I think mm -hmm. in all of our pursuits, 
having that lesson is very helpful. Just making sure that we're staying true. Definitely. There's always that balance of like pushing. I learned that in yoga, you know, you push, you push to, to do a pose that's really hard and, and to, to hold it. And then you have to rest, you know, and it's constantly that push and rest. And I'm sure with what you do, it's like, you have to, you do a push and then you, you've got to rest because the, the body needs to regenerate, but the heart does too. The soul does too. It's like you, you have to let yourself believe in the goodness and that there is goodness in the world and there's levity in the world and there's potential and possibility in the world. When you, you get buried into this stuff too deeply. I've seen it a lot with activists. They get so deep into it that they can't find their way out of it. And then they burn out and then they can't do anything because they just, they've just shorted out compassion fatigue. So I've become an expert in compartmentalizing. (laughs) Just like I can go to a restaurant with friends who will eat whatever. And I just put it in a box and it's like, that's, I'm not going to think about it right now. I'm going to think about our conversation and our connection and the goodness in that person um, rather than let myself go to what happened to that animal that's on the plate, on the table. Balance. That's such a discipline. It's so good job. Good job. Good job. And like other thing that I'm hearing you say is when you become passionate about something, it changes the lens and how you do life. Mm -hmm. Right. Like it shifts everything to support that one thing that is your like your staple. Like here's the difference Mm -hmm. that you're going to be known for Mm -hmm. and you build your life around that. And same thing with mountaineering, same thing with building a company, raising a family, doing whatever. These are things that they shift and change your entire story because Mm -hmm. you chose them. Yeah. And stepping into all the parts of that. And, you know, it's we we're responsible for keeping balanced in our pursuits so that we can do them longer. It's a marathon, not a sprint. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Exactly. Exactly. And there's an excitement when you have successes too. It's like, you know, when I'm sure when you reach your goal, it's like, oh my God, it was so worth it. All of this work that went into it, it paid off. And I, I get to forever enjoy this victory, you know, and every time I get a note from someone that says, I got it, I gave up eating meat, you know, I'm plant based now. I'm just like, that's amazing. That's 250 animals a year that have been spared by this one person not eating animals anymore. So that and that feeds me that like that just no pun intended, that just feeds my soul. I I, and it's like, yep, keep going because this is actually showing results. You know, I want to I want to go to my death at the end of my life. I want to think, you know what I did as much as I could in a field that I grew to knew to know and understand very well. You know, and that's why sometimes I'm like, I want to write a book about something else besides veganism. But it's like, well, I've just, I've become someone who knows a lot about this subject. And, and I kind of really appreciate that. No, well, like listening to you talk, I really feel like you have a book in you, not only about veganism, but just about the pursuit, right? Like the resilience you needed and like the mindset you need and the awareness and the forgiveness and Mm. all these little things that I think you naturally do just by talking to you. You know, it's so funny. You and I think so much alike. For me, there's always a book in everything. (laughs) It's like, I hear titles in my sleep and I, I, you know, I can see the way a book is, is laid out and you're so right. Because I don't think you and I are that different from other people. It's like, we want to affect change in our lives whether it's in our personal lives or the greater community, how do you do that? You know? And so we're always sharing tips and like helping each other get a leg up. Like how do we actually affect change? That's what's exciting. Yeah, no, it's so exciting. When I heard you talking about the whole piece with um, when one person writes you and they turn to vegan, when one person tells me that they decided to like walk a mile today or add walking during their lunch break instead of just sitting, I'm like, oh, Amazing. Yeah, right. <laughs> totally true. Totally true. Uh, it is, it is. Okay, so your last book was The 72 Reasons to Be a Vegan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, give us like three of your favorite, like three best reasons to be vegan. 
Uh, well, number one is like you're you're going to not contribute to animal suffering, which is amazing. Reason number two, I would say, is better sex because you have better circulation. The things that clog up the arteries that go to your heart uh, affect your brain health, also affect your circulation and the sexual organs. Okay, you got me. You got me at number two. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, and and then the third thing is that you have better energy. You just, you have all this fiber and fiber, you know, cleans out all the gunk in your body. It slows down the absorption of sugar. So you have a steady energy and you feel a sustained fullness over time. So you don't like keep shoveling in food because the fiber fills you up and it pushes uh, all the toxic stuff through your body and it just keeps your energy even. So I'm a big believer in just doing it for better energy. Yeah. You know, right. Okay. So what are the easiest ways for someone to start being vegan? Cause it took you a year and a half. So it, we're allowed to have a little time to get into that pattern for yeah. ourselves. Yeah. So how does someone start that process? Well, I would say, um, there are several things. One is find some community and you can do that on Instagram or Facebook or whatever you, you like. And then, because when you start plugging in the vegan or vegan recipes or plant-based and you'll start seeing all these fantastic recipes and meal ideas. And you're, it's like a familiarity starts settling in like, Oh my God, that actually looks really good. That looks really healthy and colorful and substantial. You know, I'm not someone who just likes a big salad. I want something that's hot and that's, uh, you know, hearty and that's going to really fill me up. And so I get ideas from, from people I follow on Instagram and friends. And, and then I think, you know, you start leaning into shopping differently. So you go to the grocery store, you look for things that you may not have bought before. So you go to the plant-based section and there's all kinds of burgers and sausages and cheeses and yogurts and stuff like that. And um, so you start getting ideas for what you can replace and I believe in crowding out rather than cutting out. Ooh, I like that. Crowding yeah. out instead of cutting out. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So I'll tell you one of my favorite vegan finds is jackfruit. Oh my God. It's amazing. Yeah. I had, I had, a, I went to a place and they did jackfruit nachos oh. and it had like black beans and then it had a cashew cheese. Amazing. Like, right? Out of cashews. And then yeah. it had the jackfruit. I was like, oh my God, I could eat this every day. Like, little did I know it was so magic. It was fantastic. So good. It's so good. Jackfruit is amazing and it's really hearty. You can put it in tacos. You can put it in all kinds of stuff. And that's what happens is you discover new things at the grocery store that you didn't even know existed. So it's kind of like, oh, wow, I, this could be actually delicious. You know, this, this, I'm going to try this recipe. Yeah, he's sorry. Are you in L.A. right now? In L.A. Laurel yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never been to Utah, though. I'm dying to go. Oh, you have to. How do you yeah. go to? Yeah, people from L.A. come all the time. It's gorgeous here. I know. I've seen pictures. <laughs> yeah, it's so I'm magic. I'm married soon, and I'm going to go and just I want to explore the state because it's just so gorgeous. So gorgeous. Yes. Biking. Yeah, no. yeah, if you come anywhere near Park City, call me. We'll go for a hike or do something. I would love it's that. so pretty. Yeah, Hiking I love you. Utah. Might be a little. Uh, oh, no, 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 I promise. <laughs> oh. I promise. I could dial it back. No okay. problems. Okay. Okay. Um, God, we've covered so many magical things. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love talking about it. And I love the, I love talking about it in a way that's not just health, it's body, mind, and soul. It's like a holistic look at one of the things we do on a daily basis. We, we eat three times a day and it has this huge effect on our health, um, the world at large, um, other beings. And um, it's just one of those things. And on our soul, I mean, for me, as, as someone who is not particularly religious, I have my values. You know, my values are kindness, mercy, stewardship of the earth. And I think there are very few things you can do on a daily basis that you get to live out your values, you know? So I love eating this way because I get to practice the stuff that's most important to me. Oh yeah. No, it is. It's definitely, and all of our 
the more holistic it is, the easier it is actually yeah. too, right? Because yeah. it all connects one to the other. Exactly. Um, okay. So then I feel like the question I always got asked when I was vegan for a while now considering going back um, mm -hmm. is the protein. Yeah. Like where are people getting the protein? And they're like, it's shocking how much protein lentils have. Like and all those okay. kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think most people, if you ask most people why they eat eggs, they're going to say it's an excellent source of protein, right? So one, because eggs don't actually taste good, just eggs. I mean, they, they, if you throw in some cheese and peppers and onions or whatever, they can taste good, but eggs by themselves are kind of raunchy, but most people will say I eat eggs because of the protein, but one egg has only six grams of protein and three of the roughly three is in the yolk and three is in the white. So you're only getting, if you're just eating the whites, cause you're trying to avoid the cholesterol. Cause there's two, I think there's as much cholesterol or more cholesterol in a single egg than there is in a, an eight ounce steak. It's insane. So if you're just eating the egg white, say you're getting three grams of protein and that's like nothing. So you'd have to eat like a lot of egg whites where you eat one cup of lentils, cooked lentils, and you're getting, I think, 17, 18 grams of protein. One cup of lentils is pretty small. And so you're getting all that protein. Plus, you're getting all those minerals and vitamins and tons of fiber. And fiber is the superhero of foods. And it just gives you all that energy like we just talked about. So um, I think people don't realize how we are sold the idea that we need all this protein. We don't need as much as people say. Um, if you're athletic, you certainly need more than the average person, but there's plenty of protein to be had in nature. Anything that grows on trees or in the ground, I mean, it has protein in it. Um, it's just the package. It's like what Harvard says, it's the protein package. What comes along with it? So in animal foods, yes, a lot of protein and you get a lot of cholesterol, saturated fat, you get a lot of potential for contamination, salmonella, campylobacter, E. coli. It's certainly not clean on the environment. So th that's that protein package. But with plant protein, you get the protein, you get fiber, you get lots of uh, vitamins and minerals. It's clean on your conscious and it's, it's a lot cleaner on the environment. So it's the package that comes along with the protein. And there's protein, you know, so yes, you can eat uh, black beans, lentils, you know, butter beans, all kinds of stuff, but you can also eat tofu is so good for you. I know there's a lot of soy insanity out there that says, you know, people say that there's uh, a lot of bad research on soy, but I th honestly, soy, there's so much, so much good information on soy that is healthy for us and the longest living people in the world. Um have eaten soy and tofu for thousands of years and with very, very, very low uh, rates of cancer, breast cancer and all, all that stuff. So um, soy is actually quite good at replacing both dairy and meat. So there's a lot of, a lot of um, uh, upside to bringing soy down, you know, in the market. So, but anyway, soy is good. Beans are good. Seitan, which is, which is made from uh, wheat. It's the protein in wheat is super high in protein. There's protein pastas like pastas made from lentils. There's all the alternative meats like, you know, Beyond Sausage and Impossible Burgers and stuff like that. There's protein powders if you need extra, if you're super athletic. So there's all kinds of of protein to be had that doesn't require an animal dying. So I like to opt for that. Yay. Save the animals. <laughs> I love it. And the climate people, like it all interrelates. Like we're all on this planet together yeah. and the decisions we make affect all of us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. And as I said, I'm not a religious person, but I do think if there's some wisdom, if there's some, you know, wisdom in the world, I don't think it's, oh, you really need your protein. And sadly, something has to suffer and you have to create something bad in the environment in order for you to get your protein. I just don't think that that is a wisdom that rings true for me. I think yeah. that if something is truly good, it's truly good across the board. It's good for me. It's good for the animal. It's good for you. It's good for our air and our water. I don't think that what's good for me has to be bad for someone else. 
Yeah, that whole win-win concept. Yeah. We all have that yeah, opportunity. Win. Yeah, win yeah. for Yeah, I love this. Well, I love this conversation. So you have nine books. There's a ton of information on the internet. The last one you did was 72 Reasons to Become Vegan. Mm -hmm. um, that's still available and easy. Like, are they all available on Amazon? They're all available, yep, on Amazon. And uh, the, the first two books I wrote were, were on relationships. I don't know how available they are, but um, yeah, but but all the health and wellness stuff is definitely out there still. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you recommend people starting with your most recent book or is there another one that you wrote first? Are you like, Hey, if you're just getting into this, start here. Well, 72 reasons to be vegan. is just like bite size information. And it's, you know, everything from sex to the environment, to the animals, to your skin tone, to everything. So it's very readable. It's uh, my co-writer, Jean Stone and I wrote it for the ADD mind because we think everybody's got so much to read right now. We, we were overwhelmed. And so we wanted to keep it short and easy. So I think that's a great place to start. Um, I wrote a book called The Lean, and that's more about if you're looking to lose weight or, you know, get your body into better shape, that's a good one to start with. Um, and if you're if you're really concerned with protein, I wrote one uh, called Clean Protein. So that's a good place to start for there. But an overall book to start with would be 72 Reasons to Be Vegan. Okay, perfect. Okay, so if there's one thing that the audience can start with today, mm -hmm. what is that? Let your mind go to what you're eating. Like awareness is, I think, the number one change agent. So don't be asleep. Kind of think it through. Like, how did the food get to your plate? And from that place, I think an intention naturally arises. And from that intention, actions will follow. Oh, that was perfect. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today, Kathy. It was so much information for all of us to Thank have. Thank you. And um, yay. Yeah, that was awesome talking to you.